stay standing. Now, our next speaker is a guy that many of you, I think, or some of you got the chance to be able to spend yesterday and the day before with him. I just got to see a little bit of what he did, but I was blown away because it was really cool stuff. And as I think Rich or someone else said earlier, he really is a great speaker. He's kind of laid back. I mean, you see him and, you know, he's dressed casual, but he's funny, he's witty, and you can tell he really knows his stuff. And I'm saying that not just by watching him speak. It's based on his results. You know, he did mass control, which many of you are familiar with, did 23.8 million in a 24-hour period. And he just informed me, he didn't, he didn't get to keep all of it, but he said he got to keep some of it, right? So pretty impressive. And now he's going to share with you some ideas. And he doesn't speak very often. He says, I don't do this. Other than his own events that are few and far between, he doesn't show up for these types of events. So this is pretty special. Give him a special, warm welcome. Please welcome to the stage, Frank Kern. Let him hear it. Come on. All right, all right, all right. It's good to see everybody. Pretty bright lights we got going on here. I hope I don't have some sort of a flashback or something as a result of them. Did you guys get a chance to see the Oscars last night? No? I guess hypothetically speaking, possibly a few people might have been partying in the bar or something. It happens. I was over at uh, Reese's house last night and we watched the Oscars. It was a very nice, quiet, romantic evening, John Reese and I, <laughs> bonding as men do while we watch actors cry and gush on stage. But I got to thinking what a nice community they have, the, uh, the Hollywood community. When you strip away all the tabloids and stuff, basically uh, the Oscars was a reflection of, it was this closely knit group of people who all worked together in an industry and celebrated each other's accomplishments, rooted for one another and uh, you know, mourned when they lost some of their own. And I got to thinking that our community is a lot like that community, with the exception that theirs is uh, obviously less attractive, uh, which is... <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I mean, they try, you know what I mean, with the makeup and the stylists and everything. They're almost, they're almost as glamorous as us, but, but not quite. And uh, I, got to, I got to think... Uh, uh, how nice it is to be part of this community. You know, you get to see, uh, you get to come to events like this and you get to meet new people and sometimes those friendships can turn to lifelong friendships and sometimes they can turn to uh, very profitable businesses. I joined this community in uh, 2001 and have made some of the longest and most uh, endearing friendships I've ever had here. And it's a good group of people and uh, I'm happy to be here. So. Let's see, let's see here. I've got my notes, I'm gonna pretend like I'm not looking at them. Everyone raise your hands, please. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I'm not gonna make you like throw your hands in the aya or anything. All right, I, I became part of this community as a result of buying Corey Rudel's uh, marketing tips thingy, all right? Years ago, I think that was in 1999. I know it was, actually, October of 1999. So I believe that most people, you're probably like, dude, shut up. <laughs> I think that most people probably are here within this community, and not necessarily here today, but just specifically part of this group we have, this family, really, because they bought something, an ebook or a course. So if that is you, keep your hand in the air. Okay. Cool. Now, when I bought Corey's thing, a little voice inside my head was like, this is probably bullshit. It's not going to work. I had to suspend disbelief, right? How many of you, when you bought the, uh, the thingy, whatever it was, had that little voice saying, this is probably bullshit. It's not going to work, but I'm going to give it a shot anyway. Keep your hands up. Pretty sure that's everybody, most people. 
Wow. Okay, you can put your hands down. Tony Robbins says, uh, I think, <laughs> he does now. <laughs> he, he often says, Frank Kern is a wonderful man and you should buy his shit. <laughs> they don't publish that very often, but he says it a lot. <laughs> um, he says uh, in your, how what the hell is it? It's in your moments of uh, decision that your destiny is shaped or something like that, right? So could you imagine what it would be like if you didn't have that little decision and at one point when you first bought that little thing, if you didn't have that moment of decision to say, ah, fuck it, I'll try it anyway. I like to think about stuff a lot. I'm a little bit of a strange person. And as I was watching the Oscars last night, um, way to go Cohen Brothers, by the way, um, I was thinking about that particular moment of decision when, when I said, what the hell, maybe it'll work. I suspended my disbelief, right, which I learned from my friend and teacher John Carlton, that phrase. And I started, to, I started to think about the evolution of this community and where we've gone and what we've been through since so many of us first came in and formed this community, because we're a new family pretty much, right? I mean, this whole, this whole stuff hasn't even been going on that long. I think the first big seminar was in 2002 or 2003. So it's easy to overlook the significance of one simple little moment. But Robin's statement is true, and I want to prove it to you, and I want to prove it to you in the context of this community. All right, and I'm going to give this little timeline, this little history lesson. It won't be boring, though, because I'll use profanity and tell jokes. Um, <laughs> I'm going to give you this uh, in the context of from my point of view. So it's possible that a few dates might be wrong or whatever, but the overall picture is what matters, all right? My name is Frank, so we'll start with me. 1995, I was very good at running businesses into the ground, had a little dog fence business. I could still do it. I'm not as good as I was. I could, if I wanted to, I could do it. Um, had a little dog fence business. Saw an ad in a business opportunity magazine for a Jeff Paul course. Suspended the disbelief. Said, maybe it'll work. Bought the course. All right? I valiantly, it was supposed to be an arrow, I valiantly did nothing, which I'm very good at. Really, an expert. I don't mean to brag, but I am. Um, years later, because I'm a Tony Robbins student, I get this letter in the mail from Tony Robbins endorsing Jay Abraham. All right. The book was 300 something dollars for a book. It didn't even have pictures in it, much less <laughs> pornographic pictures. Um, suspended the disbelief, took a leap of faith, really, because I think that's what we all do when we, when we suspend our disbelief. Bought the book. Okay. Became reacquainted and reinterested in internet marketing, which probably put a little seed in my mind to be a little bit more receptive when I saw the ad for Corey Rudel stuff, All right? All right, study Corey Rudel. Eh, things are going okay. No reflection of Corey's teachings, obviously. He was a tremendous uh, and very significant person in our industry, and I think uh, we owe a lot to him, so thank you, Corey. Um, anyway, Got turned on to Yannick Silver, who uh, I learned the idea of selling ebooks from. All right? Everybody knows Yannick. He's a friend of ours. He's part of this community. Takes me to Yannick Silver, which leads me, this is, this is not Yannick's fault, leads me personally, well, actually, yes, it is. Let's blame him. Uh, leads me to create a product called Instant Internet Empires. Anybody remember that? Show of hands. All right, my record's almost clean. This is great. Probably not my finest work. All right, well, what happened is uh, Instant Internet Empires is a collection of uh, little books with reprint rights and stuff. It threw me immediately. It's one of those lucky break kind of things. Throws me immediately into the guru world. Like, I was just a dude trying to make some money out of my laundry room in Black Mountain, North Carolina. I create this product that sells like crazy. Next thing you know, everyone's like, Frank Curtin's a marketing guru. I'm like, well, uh... That's right. Yes, I am. <laughs> You're damn right. Don't you forget it. 
All right, so that BAMO, now I'm, I'm, in this, I'm in this community, like in the spotlight. I end up getting into the spotlight a little bit more than I wanted to and was sued by the delightful good old boys at the Federal Trade Commission Brothers Band. You might have heard of them, they're awesome. Okay. Not as much fun as lots of people would uh, imagine. Okay. Remember this, empires. Now the whole point I'm showing you this is not to talk about my personal history. It's to em emphasize what one moment of decision can mean to a community and possibly to the world. Nothing to do with me personally. Forget me. Pretend I'm who anyone you want to. It's, it's not about me, as you will soon see. All right, now right around that same time, right before I got sued by the feds, I go to the first big seminar. We'll just call that Big S. Anyone else there? The very first one in Dallas? Yep, show of hands, who was there? Not a lot of folks? All right, cool. Old schoolers, I'll tell you who was there that I became friends with after never having heard of them in my life. A couple of guys. One goes by the name of Jeff Walker. The other one, John Reese. Hmm. Didn't know either one of them. Pretty cool guys. All right. Interesting. It will be, anyway. So we're hanging out at the big seminar in our own little world. And uh, Jeff says something about making six figures in seven days. Wow, says John Reese. Impossible, says I. Not impossible, says J.W., Jeff, can I ask you a question? Did it require any leap of faith on your part to attempt to make the six figures in seven days? No. All right. You just knew it was going to work. There's no shadow of a doubt. Um, I, I, had, I had no idea what it would be. I knew it would be successful. The first time I did a launch, it was a huge leap of faith. I was shocked when someone bought something for me. Okay. So you failed the first time. Is that what you said? I, I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. You uh, no, I, di I didn't fail, but I thought I was going to fail. Mm -hmm. and, and they heard the story a few, an hour or two ago. It was $1,600, and I was shocked. So after making $1,600... Frank, if you want to give me specific answers, you've got to lead me a little better. <laughs> Here, thank you. All right. Here's what I'm going for. Did you think that you were going to make $100,000 in seven no, days? All right, no. No. Thank you. Jesus. <laughs> I'm not telling you to agree with me, but if you were going to agree with me, what would, your, what would your answer be? All right. Almost threw off my whole game. I'm up here trying to look like I know what I'm doing. That's man. what I'm here for, Frank. All right. So Jeff does six and seven. Nobody thought that was possible in our industry, right? It was ridiculous. Like, if, you, if you've been around that long, and by our little community, I mean us internet marketing folks. Right? I mean, to someone like Jay Abraham or someone's like, yeah, so what? You know? But to all of us, like, other non-old-school, super heavy-duty people. It was unbelievable. That inspires John Reese to maybe try to do something. But at that point, John Reese was not the John Reese that we know. He was not teaching internet marketing. All right? So John Reese, Jeff Walker, and I become friends. John Reese decides that he does not want to teach internet marketing despite the fact that everyone in the community is demanding him to teach internet marketing. I convinced John to take a leap of faith and to do his workshop, which later became Traffic Secrets. Okay. Now, the workshop is wide, uh, wildly successful, right? I don't know if you guys remember that, but it was a huge deal. First of all, it was like 3500 bucks, which was at that time like a billion dollars for our, into, our, our little world. And he was freaked out about doing it. It becomes this huge success. That positions him as this great marketer to be paid attention to. He turns it into traffic secrets. John decides to take a leap of faith and test out this whole launch thing and see if he can't take it to a new level. What happens? What happened? What do you know? John does the million dollar day.
Because we see John do the million dollar day, our entire thinking changes, our entire industry takes on a whole new mindset. So now lots of folks are saying, well, good Lord, if he could do it, maybe I can too. So after that, I think Jeff was probably like, you know, maybe I'll teach this product launch stuff. Jeff Walker creates product launch formula. And a whole slew, which is a, a real word, of widely success, wildly successful launches happen. Uh, let's see, Stomper, uh, Butterfly Marketing. No need to actually read that. Uh, I did the Annihilation thing for Neil. Looking at my notes here. Uh, Rich did his, uh, his coaching, his very first coaching launch, which was extremely successful. All this stuff is happening because little leaps of faith, little decisions were made, right? The little voice in the back of the head was ignored. Pretty cool. Okay. Incident at Empire's FTC. I'm hosed, right? I have to go to the internet community and go, guys, I'm a little bit of a degenerate criminal. Sorry. They made me say it. I don't, you know, I don't really think I am. Not on weekdays anyway. Um, that leads me to create a little product called the underachiever method. All right, which is all about niche marketing. I took a little bit of a leap of faith to try to do some of this product launch stuff, which I was learning from Jeff was before he'd released his course. Launched that, million dollar launch. Awesome. Okay, good for me, yay, zippity doo dah. Okay. You remember, when we were talking about you join this community usually by buying something and taking a little leap of faith, one person bought this Instant Internet Empires product by taking a little leap of faith. His name is Mike Filsame. This is in no way to say I started Mike Filsame. I was just his gateway drug, so to speak. All right? <laughs> who, of course, later went on to create Butterfly Marketing and Seven Figure Code and this gigantic, sprawling empire of down-home country goodness that he has created. Think of what we've accomplished as a community since what I will internally refer to as our inception. Probably might be historically wrong, but that very first big seminar, it was for me, so this is all from my perspective. We went from a little ragtag band of a hundred or so people in a seminar room and thinking that our little in-house lists of 10,000 people were a big deal and we're all selling little $47 e-books and everything. That's in 2003. It's now 2008. Million-dollar days are commonplace. Multi-million-dollar product launches are commonplace. Huge responsive lists are commonplace. Our community has grown from this little rag, ragtag group of semi-outlaw-like kids, essentially, in our basements, trying to crank out a, a living, to this giant multinational community. We're so much more than just who we are now in this room. Like, if you were to try to encompass the entire internet marketing community, it's literally millions of people, just if you combine, like, riches and, and Phil Sames' uh, mailing lists alone, it's millions of people. So we've come a long way. Think of the people that we as a community influence, hopefully, for the better, right? Collectively, how many millions of people do you think just us in this room touch every day with our communications and our influence? What do you think it is? I don't know. 15 million people is a conservative guess to me. And then those people might buy your stuff, and then what, what could very well happen? They might go on to influence others. So, as a member of this community, I honestly feel that I am part of something much greater than myself. And the reason that I made this timeline for you, if you could call it that, this is actually, a, a, uh, if you were to hold this up to a science book, it would be uh, a, a molecular diagram of uh, alcohol. But uh, it would match perfectly. There's your sugar right there. Um, 
if at anywhere during this whole thing, that one moment where we paid attention and suspended, as John Carlton says, as, and suspended that disbelief, none of this would have happened. We would not be here right now. This whole circumstance would be different if at any time somebody listened to that voice that this probably isn't going to work voice. So I, for one, pretty damn glad I suspended my uh, moment of disbelief. Okay, stand up, please. So quiet in here. It's kind of freaking me out, yeah? <laughs> Okay, look the other way as I haul ass. All right. Remain standing if you will, just for today, suspend your disbelief and just try something. Doesn't cost you anything. Everybody? Cool. All right. That's it. That's all I wanted. It's, it's, it's more... Uh, it's more impactful than a show of hands, I think, to see everyone standing. Okay, we got that out of the way. I actually have a real presentation for you. I just wanted to, uh, I just wanted to preface it all with this thing, because I think this is all very heavy-duty stuff. We can switch to my big, fancy PowerPoint presentation now, video people. <laughs> what? Okay. I'm not going to talk to you about mass control today. I'm going to talk to you about something that could, could possibly be a greater force than mass control, and it is something that mass control is uh, built on, I guess. And it's called core influence. And the big fancy title here is how to make lots of people do almost anything, but in a cool way. I don't really like the word make there. That's why I had to throw in in a cool way. So I'm sure you're all very good people. I'm very proud to be part of this group. But if you would, please just promise me that you will never, ever in your life use the stuff that I'm going to show you now or ever in the future for bad juju. Cool? Is that cool? Yeah. Okay. If you do and I find out, I will find you, and I will persuade you to tattoo the word penis on your forehead. <laughs> I can do this. I have that power. <laughs> I learned it from Robbins. <laughs> he says it all the time that he taught me that. <laughs> Not really. Okay, today you will change your life. Pretty big claim there. Let me give you some disclaimers. Horn that from the feds. <laughs> <laughs> they could have just told me that to start with, you know. They could have just been like, uh, dude, we were just thinking you might want to give some uh, disclaimer. Anyway, <laughs> disclaimer number one. I am not a psychologist. I have not studied psychology. I have no idea what I'm talking about, really, and should never be listened to for any reason <laughs> under any circumstances. Okay? So there's that. Disclaimer number two is that I'm not here to sell you anything, all right? Like, I, I officially forbid you to buy any. I don't have anything to sell at all anyway. I already sold out all my mass control stuff. It's the only marketing product I got. Um, so no one can buy anything from me. Do you promise not to even attempt to buy anything from me today? <laughs> Would you please humor me and say that you will promise to not to attempt? Okay. I'm in, a, I'm in a little bit of a dangerous position, really, because I'm known as this mass control guy, and I think the, the perception is you never know what the, the real angle is with me. You know, like some folks might be saying, oh, he's just trying to reverse psychology us and, you know, make us want to buy stuff from him more, which is not the case. Like, I have nothing to sell. You do not give me money, please. Fine, please give me money. Um, the reason I'm, I'm so adamant about this is because we're going to do an experiment later. It's another one where you get to stand. Um, 
And I don't want you to think that the experiment is some sort of sneaky sales thing, because it's not. I just want to see if this stuff, uh, I just want to see the results of the experiment. So keep that in mind. Seriously, all joking aside, I'm not here to pitch anything. I think Rich would get mad anyway. And the final disclaimer is this is a, a major departure for me, what I'm going to show you. And this is a bit of a weird presentation, weirder than normal, in fact. Or weirder than most. I guess weirder than mo normal is kind of a stupid thing to say. Um, weirder than most presentations. It is a three-part presentation, beginning with a nice refreshing appetizer of uh, weird, heavy-duty psychological stuff. That is, it's possible that when you when you see me talk about this, uh, you'll be like, "Damn, this is heavy." You know, it is heavy. All right, not unpleasantly, depressingly heavy, but like kind of heavy stuff. Okay, and then, after our super heavy stuff, we will get into something which is dangerously close to uh, new age self-help stuff. Um, so please know that I am not a, a motivational speaker or anything. That's not my, my role here. I mean, for the love of God, people, I've created a product called the underachiever method, for Christ's sake. So that's not what that's about, but it's, we get into that for a minute, and then finally at the end is our dessert. We have a nice, warm batch of how to turn all this stuff into money. Cool? All right. Awesome. Hooray. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever, uh, have you ever been in the flow, like where everything just seems to work out right, where like everything's just cool, you talk to people, you're connecting with them, there's like, you have this effortless communication, everything you do throughout the day is, is pretty easy, and at the end of the day, you're like, damn, that was awesome. I wish I could be like that all the time. If you've ever had that experience, please raise your hand. Cool. All right. On the flip side of that, have you ever, um, I guess I'll use this, uh, have you ever like seen a, a sales presentation, maybe at a seminar or something or a business opportunity presentation where the person said all the right things and acted, did everything perfectly, you know, dressed like you're supposed to dress, said like you're supposed to, to, to talk and stuff, smiled and all that stuff, but still, for some reason, you were just kind of like, eh, yeah, raise your hand. Yes? Okay. Just wanted to make sure I'm not the only one. And now we will begin. Wow. Did that work? Okay. So, this whole core influence thing, literally, I believe, will give you the ability to get people to do just about anything you want them to do. And there are two easy steps. Step one is to know what you really want and who you really are. Uh, I will submit to you now and repeatedly that the versions, the answer to those questions that we hold in our heads right now are false. Step two is to know what your market really wants and who they really are. Uh, all right, so that's it. Thank you. Yes. Good movie that was. So we'll begin the heavy-duty, weird psychological stuff. I believe that most people carry around with them two versions of themselves, all right? The first version is the identity that they walk around in every day. I call it the shell identity. So, for example, the dude who's a banker who's walking around saying, I'm Bob, I'm a banker. I originate loans and stuff. I do banking things. Whatever they may be, I do them, seriously. All right, it's a shell identity. It's who, it's who you think you are. So, if anyone ever says, Just who the hell do you think you are, you can say, I'm the shell identity. The second identity is the person that they really want to be, and that is the identity that people really want. So when Bob's at the bank having the conversation with the teller, Mrs. Jenkins, did you organize the deposit slips and do other banking stuff? Yes, Bob, I certainly did. It was fabulous. And during that whole thing, he's daydreaming about living at the beach or being a rock star or a drug cartel or whatever it may be. That's the identity that he really wants, right? And I believe that that inner identity is our true identity. And this is, I believe this is true for everybody. That person that we daydream about, that life we daydream about, we really want to be that person. That's our deepest core desire. Therefore, I call this the core identity, and I believe this to be everyone's true identity. 
So I guess uh, to, to really illustrate it, talking about Bob at the bank, doing bank stuff, do you think that Bob at the bank, when he was a little kid, envisioned himself being a banker, going to the bank every day? Do you think he like, thought that would be awesome or like he wanted to fly planes or something? Which one? Yeah, fly planes. Okay, so Bob really wants to be. And therefore, I think, at the risk of sounding all hokey and everything, fuck it, I'll just sound hokey, I think that's the real Bob. I think the rock star, the baseball player, that's, that's who Bob really is. He's just trapped in this banker thing because of social conditioning, largely as a result of guys like me who make ads. Sorry, Bob. So I believe everyone's core identity is held captive by circumstance and a lack of knowledge. I'll explain circumstance easier because that's the easiest one, or I'll explain circumstance first because that's the easiest one to explain. Bob wants to be a uh, multi-millionaire millionaire play uh, boy living in Monte Carlo. Um, circumstances might prevent that, such as Bob ain't got no money. Easy one, right? Lack of knowledge is the most insidious reason, and that is because I believe that we, uh, we don't really know who our core identity is. Very few people ever sit around and think about that. They sit around and think about, well, I wish I had a car or a new house or whatever, but that's not really a stuff. It's not who we want to be. All right? Stay with me here. Don't make me ask you to jump up and shout and everything. So, core influence. It's the reason why I'm, I'm really good at this stuff, at selling lots of things to people I've never met. It's a core influence. Most influence is done on the surface. Call it surface influence or head-to-head -head influence. Very common stuff. I'm talking to you. You're hearing my words. You translate those into pictures in your mind or whatever. Your brain uses a little bit of logic. Your emotions kick in. You say yay or nay, I agree, I disagree, I will do this, I won't do this, whatever. Normal stuff, right? That's how 99.999% of all influence is performed on the surface level, surface influence. Head-to-head, -head, surface level connection. Works pretty good. Here's how core influence works. Infinitely more powerful, therefore often making surface influence completely unnecessary. Just quickly, a show of hands, how would you like to never really have to convince anything of anything again ever in your life? Okay, cool. That's how, what core influence does. Just want to make sure we're keeping the big picture in the, in, in the frame of our minds here. I think we communicate on two levels, head-to-head -head level, and we communicate on the core level. We're starting to gonna, we're gonna get a little heavy here. I'm gonna rope it in, but just bear with me on this heavy stuff. The lasting influence comes from a core connection. When I asked you earlier, if you've ever had that experience where everything's going really well and whenever you're interacting with people, you just seem like everyone I'm talking to, you've got this great bond with them and it's, it's all really easy. Like when you go to a party and you meet a perfect stranger and you immediately connect with them. You ever had that experience? That's the core communication. That's what's going on there. And it's just an unconscious thing that happens. You're congruent with your true identity, who you really want to be, and they are too. And when you connect, you're talking to each other. It's just right there. There's that instant connection. Like in those moments, if you guys want to go do something or whatever, it wouldn't take a lot of convincing, right? Because you're on the same plane. You're pretty much like on the same little wavelength. Core connection. All right. Pretty dangerous stuff here. When we get into the subconscious. I don't think I could even define what subconscious is, but I'll just pretend I know what the hell I'm talking about here with subconscious. I think it's your, your subconscious speaking to their subconscious. And I'm not talking about subliminal weirdness or any tricks. I think that your true person and your true intents are showing and is speaking to what they ultimately want, and those two are aligned. Does that make sense? Okay. Do you believe that our subconscious minds are really in control? There's no right or wrong answer. I'm just interested in, in, in what your feedback is. Show of hands if you believe this. Yes. Most people. Cool. I believe it too. I don't know it. How can we prove it? Actually, wait a minute. I can't. I'm about to. Sorry photographic evidence even. Take that. So, sounding weird, let me try to de-weirdify it. I don't know why I use that title. That's kind of corny. Um, 
I say you can't really control your subconscious, I think you can guide it anyway. And I think with the proper guidance that your subconscious will create a new core identity for you and this is the identity that will speak to your market on a core level. Let me rephrase it so it doesn't sound all weird. There's stuff you can do. First of all, I believe that none of us, until we do this exercise I'm going to give you, which I did not create, incidentally, really have any idea who the core identity is. We don't really know who that person is that we truly want to be. And this, I'm saying this to you at the risk of sounding A, like an asshole, by saying that none of you guys are happy with your lives and you all wish that you were someone else. So that's not at all what I'm trying to, to convey to you. I forgot what the other part of what I was going to say was. Yes, now I've remembered. It is when we, as people, become congruent, when we identify that core identity and we become congruent with what it is and who it is that we truly want to be, that is when effortless influence occurs. Well, it almost occurs. Do you remember when I asked you if you've ever seen the presentation where the dude said all the stuff, all the right things, did all the right things, dressed the right way, used the right body language, and you were still kind of, eh. What you experienced was your subconscious picking up on the lack of congruence in core identity. So to use that example, this dude is, is giving you this presentation like I'm interested in you, you need to buy my stuff, we're all going to make a lot of money or whatever it may be. His core identity could be saying, I hate people, I cannot wait to get off of the stage, just give me the damn money so I can go home and do more blow. Right? And your subconscious is picking up on that despite the fact that he's done and said everything correctly. Does that make sense? Both of you agree that it makes sense. Awesome. Okay. Now, here's where it gets good. When you can pinpoint what the true core identity of your market is, and you communicate with them congruently from your true centered state, that true core identity, you will have more power and influence than you ever thought possible. Ever. Case in point being, uh, let's see, if, uh, so they call it uh, religion. All right? Religious leaders, some are not, this is not true for all, but some, such as like a Mother Teresa, was 100% congruent. She knew what that core identity was. She stepped into that core identity and she spoke to the core identity of all the people she influenced in the world regardless of what they did by occupation, what their religious beliefs were, she spoke to that core identity within them that said, I'm a good person who cares. He wants to give back to my fellow man who wants to help and make a difference. Did it look to you like Mother Teresa was working real hard to convince anybody of anything? Yes or no? Uh-uh. Core influence. So basically, you're all going to turn into Mother Teresa. <laughs> right after I do, right? Sure. So, but you are going to learn how to do this. You're going to learn some exercises that are very easy and fun and beneficial to you that will cause this to happen. I've been doing this since 1999, marketing things on the internet, and I spent, what is that, nine years? I spent the first seven years of it convincing people to do stuff. I spent the last... Uh, uh, 18 months or so sort of convincing people to do stuff. I figured this stuff out by accident, really. And now I don't have to convince anyone to do anything. It just works. So as marketers, a lot of us with our greatest challenges is getting people to buy our stuff. The bottom line is when you do this, more people will buy your stuff and you'll generate much cooler customers and your life will be a lot better. So, remember step one was find out who you really are and what you really want? I'm going to walk you through how to do that. Does that end the weird psychological part of the thing? Maybe. I'm not sure if we're still in the weird psychological part or if we're into the uh, 
dangerously close to self-help new age stuff. As I said earlier, we're using the Bob at the bank thing. I believe that our deepest core desires give clues to our core identity. It's a weird statement to make because right now we're probably thinking of desires on a material level. And that's not what I mean. I told you guys this was heavy stuff, right? You're like, damn, I thought he was going to get up here and tell jokes. <laughs> Wish I'd have stayed at lunch. So... Why are you here right now in this moment with me together with members of your community in this room? Noah? Cool. It's a very nice thing to say to help tens of million people, or millions of people, and uh, learn how to do that. Awesome. Good call. Some, uh, sell more. Sell more? Beauty. All right. Make more money. That's probably like the front of mind thing. Uh, make more money, right? It is, after all, a conference about, I don't know, uh, business. Uh, it's typically the function of business to make more money. Cool. Good answer. I like it too. Making more money is fun. Spending it's even funner. Paying taxes on it? Not, uh, not so fun. <laughs> Another reason might be to network with your peers, right? It's fun. Go to the bar. A lot, you know, these things remind me sometimes of Grateful Dead concerts, but without the drugs. Because you see everybody, you see all these people you, you, you know, would usually only see in that uh, environment. It's almost like this traveling fun thing. So you get to reconnect with your friends and, and uh, tell war stories and all that. It's great. So network with your peers might be one. Get out of the house might be one. You will have that. Used to, I've got two young children. They're two and five now. And when they were like a lot younger and neither of them spoke English and, or, you know, <laughs> stopped screaming for more than 30 seconds at a time, I would come to one of these things. Do you want me to come to uh, the seminar and have people repeatedly throw bricks at me? Awesome. I'll be there. Can I, can I sleep past eight? Great. Throw whatever you want. All right? Or maybe it's to contribute to the community. I kind of like what you said. Sweet. So a typical thing to do, and it's a lot of, we do this a lot in sales, and we're trying to get inside the minds of our prospects, say, well, why do you want that stuff, right? Why do you want that outcome? So an answer might be, you know, why do I want more money? Why do you want to network with others? Why do you want to contribute to commu your community? So forth. So you might say, I want more money so I can get a Ferrari or whatever, right? Or so I can quit my job. I want to network with others so I can form joint venture partnerships, so I can distribute more of my products or whatever. And those are all acceptable answers, but our brains will lie to us. They are surface level answers, which are not to be discarded, uh, but they are not the absolute truth. What? When, when I say something like, I want to make more money so I can buy a new car or a new Ferrari or a new house or, you know, all this stuff, typically that's our brain giving us the surface level thing because it doesn't want to work that hard. And that's okay, right? Remember when I was saying that uh, Bob daydreams of being the rock star or whatever? That's essentially like he's replaying these beer commercials in his mind, right? I wish I was that dude. It's normal. We all do it, right? It's cool. The truth is, we all want to create and perpetuate experience. Goals and things are absolutely meaningless in the context of this whole core identity weirdness I'm talking about today. We all want to create and perpetuate experience. I'll give you good concrete examples of that. Anyone ever know of a, a guy that might want a Ferrari? Anyone ever know a man that thought, damn, I wish I had a Ferrari, that's awesome. Yeah? Is anyone here? You guys, can I have some of what you're taking, please? If we can get on the same level. Yes? Or no? Okay. Is that yes, I can have some of what you're taking? Because if you all give it to me, I think it might kill me. <laughs> all right. Well, when, when, when a guy wants a Ferrari, I know, because I've gone through the whole Ferrari thing, what we really want is... Uh, to be like James Bond or something, right? Or whatever internally having that Ferrari means to us. I want to be like James Bond or a rock star or whatever, right? Normal stuff. That's why you want the Ferrari, for the significance, okay? And of course, the big lie is that we tell ourselves and trick ourselves into believing every single day, millions of consumers believe it too, we're not alone. The big lie is that if you have the Ferrari, then You'll be like James Bond or whatever, right? 
I can hereby attest to you in front of this council of my peers that not a single flashy sports car that I ever had, and I've had a Ferrari, two Porsches, the uh, BMWs, I mean, I basically I've had them all with the exception of Bugatti, Lamborghini, and uh, Bentley. None of them ever made me any cooler of a person. It totally sucked. I was like, okay, when am I going to become cool? This blows. <laughs> you know? <laughs> when am I going to become better endowed? Surely. <laughs> I used to, when I would trade the cars in, the joke that I would tell the salesperson, they'd be like, why are you trading this Porsche in? It's awesome. I'd say, well, the, the penis extension mechanism is clearly broken. <laughs> this didn't work at all. What else do you got? Well, maybe you should try the Ferrari. Okay. Nothing. All right. What we really want with all these goals and things and bullshit that our brains tell us is experience. You want that feeling and experience of feeling like James Bond. You want the experience with the Ferrari thing. Not you, we, whatever. I'm not preaching at you. We want the experience of having the heads turn or whatever, and feeling like that rock star, right? Yes? Yeah. Cool. Okay. So, I'm going to show you an exercise in a second that changed my life. That's a really weird thing for me to say, because normally when I hear about life changing and stuff, I'm like, oh, God, you know, but it did, and I didn't even know what was going to happen when I did it. I just did it for the hell of it. When you do this, you will immediately, well, okay, it's not immediately, it takes a couple hours to do the exercise. So after a couple of hours, you will get clear focus of what your true core identity is. The freeing feeling from that is absolutely overwhelming because it strips out the bullshit, it turns off the beer commercial and helps you get down to what's real. When you communicate from this core place, you're centered, stable, and focused, cool. You also attract matches, and you're able to influence people effortlessly, specifically when you attract a match. Now, what a match is, is someone whose core identity is similar to yours. Let me ask you a question. <laughs> Do you think I'm insane? Yes. yes. All right, great. Show of hands, if your idea of a good, fun life is to build a business where you have customers who are dramatically different than you and you don't really like them. <laughs> okay, cool. Would it be fun to build a business and have customers who are a lot like you and you ge do genuinely like them and they do genuinely like you. Pretty fun. That's what I mean by you magnetically attract matches. Because when you're totally congruent and you have stepped into that core and as you'll see, you actually will begin, or at least it happened to me, you'll begin to live that life that you map out. It's bizarre. You will magnetically attract matches because they will see internally, subconsciously, heavy shit, I know, but they will subconsciously be drawn to you because you are within the place that they want to be. Does that make sense? Yes. Cool. All right. I really, this, is, this is all new stuff for me, so I was really stressed out about teaching this. I was like, this is either going to go over or people are going to think I'm the weirdest person in the world. I don't really know if there's much I can do about the second part of that, but hopefully it goes over and you guys will get it um, and, and dig it. And plus, like me, you just might actually stumble into a new and better reality and experience the following. Does this sound hokey to anybody, by, any, uh, by the way? It's okay if it does. I'm not going to be pissed off. Yeah, I mean, just please, someone say it sounds hokey to them so I won't look stupid here. One dude, okay, thank you. Thank you for having it. Uh, thank you for being honest with me and telling me that it sounds hokey. I used to think the type of stuff I'm talking to you about right now was the single biggest load of bullshit only to be surpassed by something I could make up myself, all right? And the, probably the reason why is because I've been around lots of psychotherapeutical stuff 
Uh, my mother's a psychotherapist, so I think she used me as a guinea pig. So I had this, <laughs> I know she's like, well, we'll see what happens if we uh, put him in the room with a, the, this subliminal message, you know, like, thanks. <laughs> Thus explaining that incident with the cantaloupe. Um, <laughs> what? I just put salt on it. What, do you, what the hell is wrong with you? Man, Rich said it was going to be like a nice professional place, and here you guys are. So it's, it's cool if this sounds hokey, all right? Let me tell you where I was before I did this. I had the Porsche. Ooh, I had me one of them Ferraris. Yay. I want you to keep in mind how significant that is to a guy my age, right? Or especially my age back then, like a young dude, you know, that's like, oh, Jesus, for some reason we're compelled to believe that's like going to make you the happiest person in the world. Again, probably because of people like us are convincing them that they're going to be, yeah, but still. Got to fly around on private jets. No shit. My daughter is uh, two. Her very first time in an airplane was on a, fly, a private jet. Flew her and my family to Deer Valley. Took them skiing. Took my mom. Moved to San Diego. Private jet. It was awesome. All right? Pretty cool. Had time freedom. I lived in Macon, Georgia. I could do anything I wanted to do. Uh, unfortunately, there was nothing to do uh, in Macon, Georgia. <laughs> but had there been anything to do, I could have done it. If I could have done anything other than like go to lunch and go to Barnes & Noble and then go like to post lunch... And then go to Barnes & Noble again. I, I could have done that, hypothetically speaking. All right. I, sh I kid you not, we had like this near family crisis trying to determine which big fancy mansion to buy. Not because we needed a bigger house, but simply because we could and therefore we thought, well, we should because we can, because that's what you do. You're supposed to show how significant you are by having a great big house and stuff like that. That was the big deal, okay? Does that sound like a bad life or a good life, really? I mean, those are your big problems. Not so bad, right? It's absolutely fucking miserable. Horrible. I mean, totally miserable. Get up in the morning, what now? I go to my office, which overlooked the uh, loaves and fishes homeless dude bread line stuff. Why did, why did I pick that? You know? Just absolutely miserable. One of the worst sensations I believe there is, well, maybe not the worst, I guess we could come up with lots of worse stuff, but a significantly bad sensation is to strive for your whole life for some goal and then attain it and realize it's empty. And it was all just <laughs> this illusion. So when, you're, when you have all the stuff that's supposed to make you happy and you wake up in the morning and say, now what? After about two months of that, not so cool. All right? It blows. So I hope by doing this that, if anything, I can spare someone that pain because it's very significant. So, boy, this is fun, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I was born on a ranch. My parents threw me into a pit of fire. Um, my business attracted the wrong type of customers because I wasn't congruent with the life I really wanted. I was focused on get the money and all this stuff. I built the wrong type of business. I went for the business opportunity, the early uh, biz op seekers, bottom of the barrel stuff. I attracted bottom feeding types of customers. I did not like them. I was so miserable from being inundated with all of these customers who I did not like and wished like hell to, to avoid at all costs that future business was deliberately sabotaged so I wouldn't have to complete the cycle of lameness anymore. Well, if I do this, I'm going to get more of these customers and they're going to email me and I hate them, right? <laughs> I'm just laying it out, man. It's, I mean, it's, trust me, it happens to a lot of folks. It happens for a reason, too. I was taught that uh, you want to avoid your customers at all costs and you get the money. Number one function of business is to get the money. I was taught that and I believed that for a long time. My life reflected it. Your beliefs reflect your life, for sure, right? All the money I made was just, uh, the end result of that was to buy things. And if I make an extra 200 grand, I can get a Ferrari. I can get a new house. I can be miserable in my new house. I can drive my Ferrari into the garage and be miserable, you know? All right? I shit you not, I would go out and buy all this stuff, and then instead of being like, this is great, I would sit around and worry about the stuff. Like when I would drive, when I would drive in, in Macon, Georgia, you got to like picture me living in this tiny little southern town of Macon, Georgia, driving a Ferrari, I got a little bit of attention in the thing, and I would drive around in it 
absolutely miserable driving in it because I was convinced that everyone on the road hated me and thought I was an asshole by sheer fact that I was driving the Ferrari, you know? So that's where my head was at. It sucked. Lived in a constant state of anxiety. Well, what if one of my customers finds out where I live or something and they, like, call me? Dear God! You know, it blew. 25 pounds, overweight, insomniac, chronically paranoid. I, I promise you, I would, when a car would come in front of my home, I would become anxious, defensive, and angry, thinking that might be someone that was coming to hassle me. Madness, right? A really compelling story. Oh, great. What else can you share with us? This is awesome. <laughs> and if you act now, this could be you. <laughs> now with 20%, more misery. The exercise I'm going to share with you, for lack of a better phrase, nine month total life makeover. I did what I'm going to tell you about without any real goal in mind. I just wanted to like figure out what the hell I wanted because I'm, you know, here I am, I'm buying all these things, I'm still miserable, we have this big dilemma on which fancy house. We literally went to see what the most expensive house we could possibly buy was so we could just find that one thinking, well, that, that's, you know, that'll be good, right? Yay. I went from that state to a significantly better life, which I'll share with you in a minute. I did this exercise in late September of 2005, sitting at my desk overlooking the loaves and fishes homeless dude thing, watching the junkies and the drunk people try to kill each other. Remember I was miserable, right? Hated my customers. As a result, income had declined because I was sabotaging my business. In November of 2005, did my first serializer launch. Made $360,000 in nine minutes. Holy shit. Attracted customers I liked. Pretty cool. December of 2005, I launched a product called Ultra Underachievers. Instant $100,000 per month recurring revenue business. Dang old diggity. I then discovered La Jolla, California and immediately decided to move there. Prior to my doing this exercise, I never even knew La Jolla, California existed. February, March of 2006, did my Serializer 2 class, made $640,000 in 45 minutes and became a cash millionaire for the very first time in my life. People talk about being a millionaire. Well, I've got to, you know, if you figure my house, my business, I'm a millionaire. Fuck that. If you can write a check for a million dollars, you're a millionaire, right? So I had attained that goal, which was a big deal. I was like, wow, I made it, great. And I was actually happy about it, which was cool. First time in my life. March 2006, plane, private plane, incidentally, awesome. Touched down in La Jolla, California. My family and I live there now permanently. May of 2006, I did the Annihilation Method launch with Neil Strauss, bought my dream home, began surfing, created the dream business, and started to become a little bit aware of this increased ease of influence that was happening. I was just like, you know, things have gotten significantly easier here. Damn, I didn't put two and two together about this exercise until like years later. Um, I'm a little slow. My personal income for that period, post-September 2005, when I did the exercise I'm going to share with you, $1.5 million. Wow, I was really stoked, considering it was just me, and I was moving my family. Imagine doing all that, like moving cross-country is stressful enough, right? So not only was I able to locate a new place, sell my house, move my entire family, leave, or move my you know, immediate family, leave all of our relatives and everything, home we grew up in, moved to a new city, all the stress and pressure and all that, still managed to somehow make 1.5 million bucks. Wow. Here's what the end result looks like today. All the non-fun businesses just turned them off. All right? Some folks were, uh, that are here are clients of some of the businesses that I didn't really enjoy very much. Uh, for example, my ultra underachievers class taught niche marketing 
I got to the point where I just ran out of stuff to teach. It's like, well, I don't really know how many other ways I can say find out what people want and sell them to you, so what am I going to do now, you know? So I just turned it off to eliminate the stress of trying to come up with, like, new rehab stuff. Gone. Pressure gone. All the non-fun customers, gone. See you later. Thank you. May you live your life forever in peace. I hope you find happiness eternally. Today I get paid a fortune, literally, just obnoxious amounts of money. I almost don't want to tell anybody because I'm afraid that they'll like go, oh, damn, dude, I'm sorry, that was a mistake. You're supposed to make like $7 an hour. To essentially make admittedly stupid yet fun videos uh, with and for my friends and help people get rich by helping others. It's my job now. I essentially goof off, tell jokes with my weirdo friends, and get paid a fortune for it, which is great. I'm now a cash multimillionaire, which is multiple times cooler than being a cash one millionaire. Pretty neat. And I get to surf more, which is awesome. Perhaps, well, actually not remotely the best, uh, the best outcome of this, but a significant one is now within my market, I have effortless influence in the income that I make within my market and my community. I do so effortlessly, without stress, without drama, without convincing, without arm twisting. Very few people get pissed off when I send them emails and try to sell them stuff, which is outstanding. So, before we begin, we know, do you agree with me that on any level at all that goals and things and stuff are irrelevant in the big picture for our overall contentment and happiness in life? Yes? Show hands? Yeah? Cool. All right. We know that our brain tries to convince us. Uh, it, well, our subconscious knows better, but our, our brains try to convince our subconscious that these trivial things matter. And I think in doing so, what happens is we create this internal struggle that inhibits our ability to actually get anything done. So if you're like trying to sell, I'm, I'm a nice person, you should be healthy, and then you like really just want to live in Vegas and do a bunch of blow with hookers and stuff, it's going to really be difficult to sell the I'm Mr. Nice Guy, let's all be healthy business. Extreme examples, but it's the easiest to understand, right? You, under, like, you get how that would be hard when you have that internal struggle. You can dress right, look healthy, say the right stuff. It's just not going to work out. People might buy your stuff, but you're going to like, be miserable. It'll blow. So what we want to do is we want to align our brains and subconsciousness, which we're going to do today. All right, we can all breathe a sigh of relief because this ends the somewhat weird, heavy-duty conceptual stuff. You know what? That's not even remotely true. Uh, it, it's still going to be a little bit weird and heavy duty and conceptual. But a little bit easier to follow now. All right, here's how it is. I figured out, maybe, the equation on a very basic level uh, of, of how all this stuff works. Now, I'd like you to remember my earlier disclaimer that I'm not a, a psychologist, I don't know anything about it, and no one should really listen to me ever for any reason. But if you were to listen to me, this is what uh, I would tell you. The formula is E plus I equals L. All right? E stands for experience. I think we, we can all agree now that we don't really want the stuff. All right? Even Rich earlier said, like in, his, uh, in the first part of his, his presentation yesterday, after thinking for so long that internet entrepreneurs wanted the money, do you remember what do they really want? Freedom. Right. What is freedom? Experience. We don't want the stuff, we want the experience. And, and, and then we want the experience that the things give us. Starting to get a little heavy, stay with me here. I stands for identity. Our experience, beliefs, and values create our identity. You can actually have those experiences externally, such as I'm now playing baseball and all that kind of stuff, or you can have them internally while you're daydreaming, running the beer commercials in your mind. But that plus I, uh, beliefs and values creates our inner identity. So the L is life. And I believe that experience plus identity equals life. They work together, I guess, to form our lives, or at least our concept or, per or perception of what our lives are. All right. Here's the big aha. What we all want, me, you, everybody else, is a new life. We don't want the stuff. We want the new life. And this is not at all remotely 
given to you from the perspective of, so now you all need to go out and change your lives forever. There's not, as far as I know, there's nothing wrong with your lives, right? Isn't that funny how it's like, today's going to change your life, and everyone's like, yay! And then you like, no one ever says it's going to change it for the worse. Like, what if it sucks? Like, today's, we're going to change your life. Yeah, because we're going to cut off your left foot, you know? So, shit, it was pretty good to start with, all right? So I'll illustrate it. When a family buys a new home, they're not buying brick and mortar and shingles and carpet and stuff. They're buying that new life that they'll experience in the home, right? They don't want the home. They want the new life. Very basic thing. I believe that applies on some fundamental level to every single thing that is sold ever. Some part of your brain is saying, is this going to move me towards or away from my core identity? All of us, mine, yours, all the rest of the world out there. That's the way it works. So, here's how to create a new life. First of all, when I told you about that whole nine-month experience I had, would anyone like to experience something similar? Yes. Cool. You never know, right? Some people might be like, no, I'm happy. The bank's nice. They've got health benefits. Shut up. Get a haircut. So, <laughs> what makes you think I haven't already? Ah, all right. Sorry, that was not intended for this audience. Um, let's see. <laughs> if we all live um, an average of 40 more years, you know, give or take, I guess on average all of us in this room might live another 40 more years, and we're going to live 14,600 more days, starting now from today. All right, now if you look at what a life is, it's really made up of individual days, right? You remember we said our experiences really shape our lives, our experiences and identity. Well, you get the experience from every single day, okay? So, I believe that if we want to find out truly what this core identity we have within us is, and we, and we want to learn how to identify it in other people, we have to create the ideal day. We have to identify what the perfect day in our lives would be. See, typically it's like, well, what do you want your ideal life to be? And it's like, well, I live in this big house and I got a Ferrari and all that stuff. And that's, so it's okay, but it's the individual day that holds the key to what you truly want, what we all truly want. When I say you, I'm not like preaching at you at all. Like, forget me, you know, it's us. We're all collective. So here it is. A lot of, it's a, it's a lot of buildup leading up to this one question, right? Good Lord, I've been here for like three hours. <laughs> When I told you I did this exercise in September of 2005, the entire exercise was to simply answer this one question. If there were no limitations or consequences, what would your perfect average day look like? If there were no limitations or consequences, what would your perfect average day look like? Not that heavy, right? Now we're into the dangerously new age stuff. But we are no longer going to talk about weird conceptual heavy stuff, which is cool. Um, okay, language is very powerful. So let me dissect the question for you. When I say limitations, I mean if we had no financial, geographic, health uh, limitations or limiting people. So if like a perfect day, your idea of a perfect day is you wake up on the beach in Hawaii and you live in Macon, Georgia, well, let's pretend that there are no geographic locations, right? Let's pretend that we've got all the money we could possibly want. If you can't, you know, if, you're, if your perfect day is to wake up and go surfing and, you know, you've got a broken leg, let's pretend that your leg is not broken, right? Easy stuff. If you have limit, limiting people in your life and your perfect day is to be away from those limiting people, let's just say you got away from them. Pew. Consequences is important. That's stuff that could get, uh, get you into trouble. So, it might be tempting to say, my perfect day involves waking up, drinking a liter of vodka, going and racing my Formula One car to be followed by a cocaine binge with a, a, a truckload of hookers. That will kill you. Okay, so I don't think, realistically, that is your perfect average day. All right? And finally, I use the word average. It's very important that you really get the language right in this. You could do it every day and not get sick of it or get killed. Average, everyday stuff. Now, you might be thinking, 
Well, never mind, I should just show you this. So, it's like a 400 part question, really. <laughs> but it's still two easy steps, all right? <laughs> Step one, build a giant house. Step two, walk through the door, you know? Um, When you think of this, this perfect day, it's important not to think about stuff, all right? We're going for experience. That's why the question is framed around a day. If you say life, you think about stuff, right? We all do. We think about the big mansions and the cars and the jets and all that stuff. So where would you live in this perfect day? You don't have to, like, write all this stuff down. It's normal questions, right? What would your house look like? Would it be clean inside? What would it smell like? What time would you wake up? What would you do in the morning? What would you think about in the morning? What would you say? What are your first words of the day? What are your first thoughts of the day? It's vitally important to drill down to the seemingly mundane, weird stuff. And when you do this exercise, I don't expect you to do it now, because it, it took me, I'm a little bit slow, but it took me like four hours to do it. I had like literally, I don't know, 11 or 12 pages was the answer to the question. What would you have for breakfast? Mundane, but still, you got a certain thing you like to eat, don't like to eat, place you like to go. I, went, I got as specific as to, to drill down into mundane stuff like what I was thinking about when I took the children to school and what I was thinking about when I dropped them off and what I was thinking about when I got home. The more detailed you get about this, the more clear you become and the more profound your outcome will be. Or would you spend the first half of your day? You know, would you go to yoga? Right? That's what my wife does. Every day, yoga. I've got to say, I'm a big fan. I like that. There's a lot of benefits of that thing. You know, like, hey, wow, this is great. Um, well, I mean, she could go to wrestling or something, you know? I guess maybe that would be cool, too, you know, we think about it. Um, what would you have for lunch? Seriously, like, what would you have for lunch? Who would you eat with? What would your friends be like? All right, when I answered this question, I rewrote the, the behavior of my friends. I believe the specific answer was, we have a healthy lunch at a good place. It's got fresh food that we enjoy. Our conversation is not about idle gossip, but more of a celebration of the fun we have had earlier in the day and, the la and since the last time we saw each other. So what will you talk about? What are your friends like? The perfect day. Like, so imagine another way to frame this question is if whatever you write down, you have to live that day every day for the rest of your life. It's another way to look at it, okay? What would you do for personal fulfillment? Okay? I, I, I've tried, and um, it's, it's, you can't, you can't screw off all the time. You'll end up wanting to do something for personal fulfillment. What life purpose would you strive towards? That's a big one. Try to answer it honestly. Because you might find, like I did, your answer is dramatically different from what all of your energy and time is focused on right now. If it is, you've got a serious mismatch and that blows. And it's going to come across in every presentation you do. What would your business be? What time would you start work? What would you actually do at work? All right? For mine, it was coming up with evil schemes. The, the use of the word evil there is not really very, uh, very nice sounding, so I'd define an evil scheme as just something fun, I said in jest. What are your clients like? What's your relationship like with your spouse and your family? I wrote mine down. What do you and your kids talk about? What's that like? Not like we like each other, but why? What fun stuff do you do? What do you like about each other? What does your spouse like about you? What do your children appreciate within you? You, got, you have to live this day every day, forever. Every day. Just imagine Osama's got the button on the destroy the world, or his finger on the destroy the world button. If you deviate from this day at all, he's going to press it. Okay, so you got to live it every day. 
<laughs> Why I put this under the really big stuff, I don't know. I guess that's a reflection of where my mind is, right? Dinner is family stuff, though, right? I mean, that is my house, so would you have dinner with your family? Would you go out? Whatever. What would you like to eat? Who would you eat with? What would you talk about? What would you do at night? Who would you do it with? I think we might have just uh, had a little Beavis and Butthead moment there. <laughs> I said, who would you do it with at night? But, you know, I mean, what would you... <laughs> and, hey, like, speaking of that, you don't have to show this to anyone, by the way, but if the whole, you know, if that, the answer is dramatically different from your current situation, you should put it down. You don't have to show it with anybody. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm going to show you some of mine, though. <laughs> Where would you do it? What would your thoughts be as you went to sleep? That was a big one for me. What are you going to think about? Those last conscious moments of the day, where's your mind? Where is it now? You know, go to bed worried about stuff? You go to bed thinking about where the next sales come from? Or, you know, what's going to happen if Google slaps you? That blows. That's no fun. I've done that. It's awful. All right. So... All this build up for one little question. Sound any hokey? Yeah? Maybe? A couple of raise your hands if you're like, dude, all this for one stupid question? What the hell? One dude? Thank you for really being honest. I would never have raised my hand. Right? I'd be like, no, man, it's fine, really, it's cool. <laughs> I would have never ever I mean I really like agonized over whether or not I should present this right now. Because typically it's like, you know, I, I do these things and I rarely do them and I tell some jokes and you know, disguise content as entertainment most of the time. And it goes over very well, and then people say, we really enjoyed that, and I get to go home, and it, and it was fine, right? But I was hoping I could really contribute back to my community today, so that's why I'm here. So, I did the exercise. Did not do it as this, I want to develop and identify my inner core stuff. Had anyone presented the exercise to me in that of mind, I would have never done it. I just said, yeah, whatever, shut up. I just did it because I was like miserable and every day sucked. And I was like, well, okay, what the hell do I want to do? And I was like, well, let's pretend. Perfect day, right? Now check this out. Indy and I wake up with the sun and laugh about funny things our children did as we watched the day break over the ocean. Incidentally, the reason I'm giving you this presentation today is because I moved from one office to the other after my mass control launch. I moved into an office uh, closer to the beach, and I found the piece of paper, actually the notebook with all the answers in it. And I started reading it, and I had this big aha moment. So I dug it out, and here are, here are the answers to some of my questions. So the first one is, what do you do when you wake up in the morning? What are you thinking about? Whatever. That was my answer. Check this out. That's the view from my bedroom. <laughs> Can you believe that? Had, uh, none of this was planned for me, okay? It just happened. That's the first thing I see when I look out the window. That's it. Ta-da! Weird. I'm starting to think this might not be so much bullshit, okay? But I need lots of convincing, so I'm going to assume that you do too. In the morning, we're excited to get outdoors and exercise. Remember, I was 25 pounds overweight. My activity was to go eat lunch, then go to Barnes & Noble, and then go have a relunch, all right? I hated exercise, Okay? I wrote down, though, because I wanted to have this that in my ideal life. That was it. In the morning, we are excited to get outdoors and exercise. I look forward to this and view it as fun. It is not a chore or a mundane task, but a source for continued fulfillment and well-being. It's fun, and I would do it even if it wasn't good exercise. See the little dot? That's me. Christmas morning, 2007. Every day. No moss, 25 pounds. Maybe it's not bullshit after all. I had never even touched a surfboard in my life when I wrote that. Never. I don't even know if I'd seen one in real life when I wrote that. In mine, I would describe the house. I told you not to focus on things, so you don't make it all about things. But if something comes up like it did in mine, I described my home, write it down. After exercise, I take a shower. Our shower is huge and made of marble and glass. It has a bench to sit on and lots of jets so we can both get in there. The point is to show you the shower. 
Six people can get in that shower. <laughs> three can sit on the bench and three can shower under the 14 jets that are in there. The people on the bench can help if they like or they can simply watch. It's up to them. It's marble. It's, it's marble. It has a bench. It has multiple jets. It's the exact same thing I wrote without even consciously saying, this is what I'm setting out to do. It wasn't a goal-setting exercise. I just said, shit, this, this day sucks. What would a good day be? You can never really get anywhere unless you know where you're going, right? So the whole point of the exercise for me was not to have this entire life transformation. It was just to, to see, well, if I'm so miserable now, what is it that I actually want? So shell versus core identity. My shell identity was, was motivated by things, goal-driven, status-driven. The reason I was buying the cars was because I wanted people to think I was cool so all the people that thought I was a douchebag in high school could see how cool I was, right? Let's get honest, okay? Get the money, get the money, get the money. Uh, right? zippity doo da. Miserable. That was my shell identity, though. So common on some variation with all of us. The core identity was I truly didn't give a shit about any of that stuff. I wanted to leave normal society, live at the beach, cultivate an ideal lifestyle, and get paid to have fun and contribute to others by doing so. What do you know about that? Huh. What's this got to do with making money, which is the whole point of the conference? Well, I didn't give you all the stuff that I wrote down. Remember when I said describe what you do at work, when you go to work, where you go to work, and all that stuff? Check this out. In describing my business, at the time, my business was a really big part of my identity. It's not so much, but I described what I wanted it to be. I wrote down, my business is fun and easy. My main function is to simply come up with cool ideas that help me and my clients make tons of money without being obnoxious about it. It works so well that I'm able to generate a huge income from only a small amount of sales. Huh, okay. Check this out. My customers are cool, fun, and low stress. I actually enjoy interacting with them. And if I were to encounter them on the street, I'd be happy to see them and would not walk the other way. Complete 180 from the life I was living and my mentality regarding my customers at the time. I think, uh, well, that's a nice sounding title, isn't it? Since I did the exercise, September of 2005, generated almost $31 million in revenues for myself and my clients. And by clients, I just mean the dudes I did stuff directly for. God knows what the people I've taught have made. We don't even count that. Right now, my business, one of them, is on pace this year alone to pay me close to $2 million in passive residual income if I never sell another product all year. Are you starting to believe me now when I say, please don't buy anything from me? I'm not here to say I'm doing okay. Okay? Because this is on video, I, I didn't want to use people's real names, so I use their nicknames. Mahler is a friend of mine. I see him regularly. He's the first person to ever recognize me in, in public. He's my friend, and he was one of my customers. As is Fizzle, Butter and Gypsy. And Fizzle, Mahler, see him very regularly, some almost every day. Customers hang out with these people. I went to Mahler's wedding and wanted to. How many times did you actually want to go to somebody's wedding? I was like, dude, this is going to be killer. All right, you know, wanted to go. Magic Ryan, Rabble Bowski, friends of mine, these are all people who were customers who fell into the previously dreaded God help us all if any of these people ever call me on the phone or find out where I live category, all right? Customers. About three days ago, no, not three days, three weeks ago, I was leaving the new office rode a, my new exotic vehicle, which is a Sector 9 skateboard. It cost me about $100. Rode it down to the beach to check the waves. Hanging out. Decided that it was uh, pretty good. I was going to go out and get in the water. I hear this, hey, is your name Frank? Look over. 
It's this girl and a couple dudes. Girl was pretty good looking too. I was like, this is, just keeps getting better. And I said, yes, it is. Turns out they were customers. Just happened to be in my neighborhood at my beach. Either that or they were psychotic stalkers. I'm going to hope that they were customers, right? I was glad to see them. Previous life, I would have been horrified, mortified. You know what's cool? They didn't hassle me. They're like, oh, dude, you going surfing? Sweet. Yeah, we're in your, your class. We're just making some videos down here. Have fun. Awesome, right? Check this out. Since I got here in Orlando, I arrived Thursday, hang out with my buddy Johnny, two random, unsolicited, just happenstance emails from new mass control students, one with a video attached where he made $25,000 in four hours, the other saying he brought in $90,000 in one week. Does that sound like a little bit of a transformation to you guys from circumstance? All right. Ha. Huh. <laughs> Would everyone please stand? You want to stretch a little bit or something or jump around or whatever you're supposed to do? <laughs> All right. Remain standing if having a business that pays you an obscene amount of money where you get to do something so much fun that you think to yourself, I cannot believe I'm getting paid for this, and your customers are cool people that you actually like and who like you and you want to hang out with them, remain standing if that sounds cool. Okay? That was really, that wasn't a loaded question at all. Right? Remain standing if right now you might be thinking, you know, I like life pretty good, but I've never really sat down and thought about what an ideal day would be. I've never really considered what the perfect life would be. If I were to say to you, I have a workshop or a class or whatever where we'll walk through this process together and you will have a clear path of what you want and based on my personal experience of what happened to me I believe it can happen to you as well would you be interested remain standing if you would be interested okay now if I were to say this workshop costs a thousand bucks remain standing if you would be interested if I were to say, this workshop costs $2,000, remain standing if you'd be interested. Okay. Most people are still standing. The good news is there's no workshop. This was the experience. You can sit down. There, this was the experience, the experiment that I was telling you about earlier. This is why I was so emphatic about telling you that I was not really trying to sell you anything. I'm not. There's this, it's a fictitious product that doesn't exist. Okay, look what just happened. I've begun today's presentation by telling you under no circumstances should anyone ask me to sell them anything. Okay, that is the absolute worst sales pitch ever, right? Don't buy anything from me. Do not buy anything from me. I just got up here and talked to you guys about some of the weirdest shit you have probably heard in months, if not years, especially at an internet marketing conference, right? But what happened? With absolutely no effort at all and without in any way at all trying to convince anyone of anything or to sell anything at all, the overwhelming majority of the room said that they would buy the stuff. Why is that? It is because I'm speaking to you now from my core identity. See, I did the exercise. I figured out the life I wanted, who I really was who I wanted to be, stepped into that person, didn't know what was going to happen, damn, if I'd known that, I'd have done it sooner, right? And spoke to you from that core, centered, congruent place. Because I've serviced this market for so many years, I know that you guys share the same values as me. So while your dream life may not be to live at the beach or have the marble shower that could hypothetically fit six people, just saying it could, that's all I'm just saying. <laughs> or surf or whatever, grow your hair long and not give a damn. I, well, that may not be the exact match. I do know 
that the core identity of this group is a group that values freedom and lifestyle and experience and contribution and overall contentment above all else. Therefore, was I communicating this entire time with your surface identity or with your core identity? Core identity. It works. Yes, it sounds very weird. Yes, I am very weird. But it works. We just proved it, that it works. Now, I know this to be fact, right? If I actually said, okay, give me the money, not everyone that was standing up would say, here's two grand, right? Maybe half would. Still, pretty good, okay? No convincing, no being an asshole, no obnoxious stuff, no stress. All's cool. Would you like to learn how to do the same? <laughs> no, thank you. Okay. Well, the second step, first of all, if you do nothing, please answer the question. Please. It will change your life. What more proof do we need? I mean, you know, the secret's out now and all that stuff. Man, I, even like up until a couple of weeks ago until I found the stupid piece of paper that I actually wrote, I was like, those people are such charlatans. They are full of shit. Like, what more signs do we need to say this stuff works? Okay, so whether or not you do anything at all, please just answer that question. It will do you so much good and you will be happy. Step two, find out who your market really is. Okay. We talk about empathy a lot, right? Great salesmanship, you must have empathy. You must know how they feel, think like they think. At least convince them that you do. Yeah? Sort of the key. I believe that you must genuinely identify their core identity, know what their real desired outcome is, and know what life they really want. That's why, had I like focus this whole thing about things and money and you two going to have a fancy watch and all that stuff, I wouldn't have had 90% of the folks in the room say, I think it was almost 100% say they give 1,000, like 90-something percent say they give 2,000. That wouldn't have happened if I wasn't speaking to that core, right? So you have to figure out the core. This is critical. None of this will work if you don't do this. None of this will work if you don't do this. Lo and behold, you must actually give a damn and you must actually help your prospects and customers move towards that core identity. If you don't care, it's not going to work. And you're not, gonna be, you're not congruent with your core anyway. Critical. So if you're in a business right now, and you honestly don't give a damn, you're in the wrong business. Doesn't mean you're a bad person. I've been there too, right? It's just you're not in the right business. So you've got to care, and it's got to work. You have to genuinely help people. It's kind of a weird thing to say when we're talking about helping people. Here's the weapon I use to help people. I'm, uh, I'm touted as a good copywriter. I'm not, really. But it's nice to hear. Thank you. Not a good salesman at all. I can't even put on a decent pair of coat. Can't even wear shoes. You know? Not a good salesman. Not a marketing genius. <laughs> I had to find, no, you know, don't go taking my trademark, damn it. I'll take you out. Okay? <laughs> I think I got all that reputation and stuff. People say, oh, Kern, good Lord, man, the guy's got the voodoo. Especially right now, because I just did this big launch and mass control and all that stuff. Yeah, oh, wow, this guy's killer, right? Well, if you look back, I really just do a good job of selling to the internet marketing crowd, specifically, okay? It's not like I couldn't like, write copy for refrigerators or something. <laughs> couldn't do it, right? Yeah, so... Um, Well, really, I mean, we all know this. No one wants to come up, let's just get it out in the open, okay? Come on. That's all. 
So there's a reason why I'm really effective at selling to this market. Okay, I'm not going to tell you I can sell to every market, right? I can't sell really well to this one, sold okay to the dating market. Had I known this stuff in other niche markets, I would have really, really been much more effective. This is a method called the instant bond method. It is step one of two on identifying your market's core identity and learning to speak to it. Probably when I say your market, um, I'm doing everyone a disservice, including myself, because person to person selling is most effective. Like if we sit down across the table or preferably side by side at a table, um, that's most likely the most effective way to sell in terms of closing the sale, right? Hard to get better than that. But we always think of marketing as we're marketing to this herd, okay? Which doesn't make sense. If, if, if uh, selling face to face, and we should always think face to face. So when we design campaigns, we usually market to a group of people, right? Yeah. Uh. You need to design every single piece of your market, marketing as if you were speaking to one person specifically. Well, I'm in, a, I'm in a very bad situation now. I've got three of these bottles of water up here, all open, only one of them is mine. Very thirsty. I don't, thank you. I don't want to have to drink after Walker. You never know what he's put in it. How else do you think he's so smart? You know, it's the smart pills. Okay, hang on a minute. Am I doing good so far, by the way? Yeah? Okay, cool. Thank you. I was very, very apprehensive about trying to convey this. I think if I didn't have the photographic proof, it wouldn't have gone as well. So when you're, when you're communicating with one person... I call it the core customer. I call it that because I came up with it on the plane when I made that slide. Um, call, call this person anything you want. But this is like the core, this one person. So here's how you create that person. If you could somehow magically manifest one single person who would be the typical embodiment of a classic customer or prospect in your market, what would they be like? Male or female? It's almost like if you, were to, if you were to ask me to pick them out from a crowd, who would you describe, you know? How old are they? Are they married? Some folks have been around a while might start thinking about list data when we're doing this. And that's not really what I'm getting at. I want you to instead of thinking about uh, demographics, we want to think about the life of this person. Okay, what a typical day in their life is like. like. Who they are, not as a buyer, but as a person. Because we communicate as people. And when you get into the, I'm selling you the buyer stuff, it's lame. Okay. Do they have kids? Oh. What's their spouse like? The reason I asked that question, and the following one, which is what does the spouse think of all this foolishness? is because we make so many decisions based on what we believe the opinions of others will be, and one of the most influential people in a household is the spouse. Except mine, where I'm totally in control all the time. <laughs> it's all me, all the time. Right. Um, what's their relationship with the children like? What would this person be wearing? Would they be wearing, I don't know, latex, uh, a latex uh, helmet, or would it be leather? You know, there's so many forms of headgear now. What do they do for a living? What's their biggest frustration? What's their biggest surface desire? All right? Stuff like that. So I did this exercise, and this was back when I was selling to the Internet Marketing crowd from the perspective of newer people um, just looking to make uh, money. Oh, um, uh, yes. Okay. 
Don't read that, because I can't fit my description of Bob on the screen. All right, so when I did this, again, this is for the beginner's internet marketing crowd. I did this exercise some time ago, and I created my, my little dude named Bob. All right, so here's Bob. Bob is 45 years old and sells insurance. He is married with two children who drive him crazy. And his wife thinks he's an idiot for trying this internet stuff. He's about 25 pounds overweight and wears glasses. Wears a short-sleeved, button-down shirt, which is white, and he wears khaki pants with it. His shoes are brown leather. His biggest desire is to make enough money to quit his job, which pays him $45,000 a year. That's Bob. If you were to go right now, if we could teleport to a typical beginner's level internet marketing pitch fest seminar, I mean, that's who you'd see. Lots of bobs at those. Not so many bobs here. It's not that event, right? Different crowd. But that's Bob. So who is your Bob? The question you need to do is you need uh, to identify your Bob. Cool? Now this step, step one of step two. Great at this. <laughs> Remind me sometime to become a surgeon. We're going to uh, cut open the femoral uh, brain lobe? No? Sorry. Okay. Just by doing this exercise, we're already halfway there to identifying your, your market's core identity. You're already 100% ahead of most people in the market. Everyone else is a little bit of a strong word. Because what we're doing right now is now that we know who we're writing to specifically, you can influence them on the surface. Like when, when I identify who Bob really is, I know that Bob is drawn to the big paycheck images. I know that Bob wants the new car, right? Because Bob's new at all this stuff. Bob is the guy that's at the insurance job, miserable. His kids are driving him crazy. The dude's coming home. He's confused. He's scared and all that kind of stuff. That's what he wants right now. Okay, so when I know that sort of stuff, we can influence them on the surface level. Surface level influence works really good. Almost everything we've ever seen is surface level. Okay? All right, so when you do this, you're better at selling to your market than most people are. Just the surface level stuff, because most folks sell to their market without really thinking about who their customer is. It's just step one. If you stop here at step one, you're still going to come away with a lot. All right? I sold instant internet empires based on step one. I did $640,000 or so personally in sales on the front end. From that, the back end sales were more. According to the FTC documents, it was $640,000 anyway. Created a product called Info Millionaire, which I, which I really enjoyed selling. I thought it was a great product. Made around $300,000 or so from doing that. Pretty good. You know, yeah, not bad. That thing was only up for a couple months. Um, made my underachiever mastery course, surface level influence after identifying Bob. Bob gave me a million bucks or so from it. So surface level influence with this empathy thing. A couple years, Bob gave me around two million bucks. Thank you, Bob. Now, if you want to absolutely crush it and have more influence and sales than you can stand to the point where you actually have to say, in all seriousness, please do not buy anything from me to a group of people with money who have proven to buy stuff from people like me. Here's what you do. You become Bob, metaphorically speaking. You remember the question that I asked you to ask yourselves? about your perfect average day. Well, now that you know who Bob is, it's time to pretend. You need to pretend like you are Bob. This is why I was telling you not to look at Bob like a person on a direct mail list data source. That's why we need to know the mundane things about Bob, what his kids are like, what he wears, 
what he does for a living. We don't care if Bob has an American Express card with $10,000 on it. We don't care about that marketing data. We want personal data. Okay. You step into Bob's shoes and you run the little magic question, effortless transformation, 2000 exercise as if you were Bob. Are you going to be exactly right? No. You're pretending to be someone who is a you know, a representation of thousands of people within a market. You've never met Bob. But you're going to be close enough. All right? Now you know who Bob really is. Now you know what Bob really wants. Okay? So, remember when I was given all my like weird, ethereal sounding stuff, saying, you know, when you meet someone and you have this connection with them and you don't even know why, but you really feel bonded to them and you like them and they like you and you feel like there'd be no convincing or arm twisting with anything involving you guys, when you do this now, you're speaking from your core to Bob's core. Okay? So here's the real Bob. I think you should also know that when I came up with who Bob was, I did it years ago, and it was by no means any insult to this ideal person. You know, there's nothing wrong with making 45 grand a year or wearing brown leather shoes or whatever. I'm not trying to say, like, Bob sucks and should be taken advantage of or anything like that, all right? Here's the real Bob. Bing! Notice that behind the back? Pretty good. Real Bob, significantly afraid of loss and embarrassment. In my market, right? significantly afraid of loss and embarrassment, but does not want to openly admit it. Bob is typically male, and us fellas don't like to admit that we're scared of stuff. We're scared to. We're afraid to admit that we're afraid of stuff. Bob wants a lifestyle more than things. Bob wants significance and contribution more than bling. Significance and contribution. Big drivers, by the way. Bob wants respect and credibility. And Bob wants to be young again. That's the real Bob. So remember when I showed you, like, the results of selling to Bob on the surface-to-surface -surface basis before I really got to know Bob? Before I became a weird psychotic stalker and pretended to be Bob? Once I started figuring out who Bob was, the first thing I tried to sell was the serializer system. One million dollars from 100 customers. Got to keep it all. No affiliates, no big list, no big fancy launch. Nothing. This one sort of counts. I faked it with the uh, Neil Strauss launch because I'm not in that market at all. And I can't really step into the shoes that much of the guy trying to pick up women, and it doesn't really speak from my core to their core because it kind of weirds me out a little bit. I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but it's just I got daughters, man, you know? So part of me is like, here's how you should pick up girls, but if you ever do this with one of my daughters, I promise you I will draw you and quarter you. You know, so it's like not really working out that well, but it still worked out pretty good, $1.4 million. Now that I have a better understanding of what Neil Strauss actually teaches, or what Neil Strauss actually teaches and what that's all about, I think I could do a much better job of that. But still, as an experiment, because I, I would like to say publicly that that's not what his product is about and that's not what he's about at all. He's a genuinely good, caring person. Um, so, 1.4 million ain't so bad, though. First time, incidentally, anyone had ever tried to do a big, fancy launch outside of Internet marketing, right? So he works in Internet marketing. Okay, let's see. All right. Hit the nail on the head with Stompernet. Damn. I didn't even want to do it. 18.3 million bucks. I'm the guy that wrote all that stuff. You know, I'm the one that scripted those videos. I'm the guy that made the markets fall in love with Brad and Andy. It's me. 18.3 million smackers. Pretty good. Pipeline profits, 3.1 million dollars. Mass control, which I just launched a bunch. 400 billion zillion dollars. <laughs> the refund periods aren't over yet, and I don't want to jinx myself. 
you know. But a lot worked. It exceeded my expectations, actually, dramatically. It was also the easiest one I've ever done. Strange. So you get this down, remember I said effortless influence, effortless income? It's easy. Experiment began unknowingly in September of 2005, which is right around two and a half years. Remember what I did on the, uh, on the surface level when I just did the empathy thing? and Around two million bucks. Now it's around 31 million dollars. Works. Very strange, right? Very, I mean, I know lots of people are like, okay, we're going to find out what the best subject line is today. Yeah. It works. Do it. So, after I made this, uh, this long, protracted, obviously strange presentation for you, it occurred to me that it had absolutely nothing to do with the stuff that uh, the sales letter for this event talks about. And I worked myself into a bit of a panic because it was too late to change everything, mainly because it was this morning when I was reading the actual sales letter. And I was like... <laughs> Holy shit, I'm not supposed to talk about this stuff at all. So I know that uh, folks might still be thinking, okay, that's really cool and everything, but what do I do and say specifically to people to get them to buy my stuff? Am I going okay on time, incidentally? Fellas? Are you saying, is, am I getting the signals for yes or no? I'm getting, the, I'm getting the no signal. So, I'll speak quickly. Here's the deal. Every piece of marketing that you do, every single thing you do matters. Every single thing you do, say, think, or write to your market matters. Everything. Does every single thing you say to your market matter, yes or no? Yes. Okay, good. Well, you know, I can say things like this to my children. I'll be like, don't draw on the wall, and it comes out wrong because they still draw. So I want to make sure that's not me, you know. It always needs to validate their core identity and move them closer to it. So if you look back at the, the, my most successful launch, perhaps not monetarily, but at least with greatest of ease, and I got to keep a lot of the money this time, which was nice, it was the mass control launch, which I just recently did. If you go back and look at the marketing materials, which you can find on my blog, frankkern.com, you will notice that throughout the marketing, money was talked about very little in terms of you're going to make a bunch of money with this, right? I didn't go out and say you're going to make millions of dollars. I used that big $23.8 million figure to get people's attention. Sometimes you need to get attention on the surface level, right? Bam, hey, psh, surface level attention, money, Jesus, I got to look at this guy. But then went straight to the core once I had the attention. Okay, so every single piece of marketing in that launch addressed the core. I had pictures of me at the beach. I talked about living at the beach. I talked about my family. I had pictures of my children on my computers in the video. It was all about significance and contribution that the market could, could, uh, could make in their marketplace, how they could build a better life, how they could communicate more effectively for a good. Not about the money. Every single piece addressed that core identity and was written to them, all right? What was the other thing I had on there? <laughs> and it moves them closer to it. So you, right. Moves them closer to it with results in advance. So you can't just talk about it and paint the pretty picture. Every single piece of marketing that you give actually has to help people. Imagine. That's just patently ridiculous, but it does. Damn it. It does anyway, right? So if you look, every single piece of marketing that I gave out was not clever salesmanship, was not awesome copy or well-produced video or anything. It was just me being a regular dude helping people out. You need to build a list? Here's how you build a list, okay? You want to learn how to communicate effectively and not be obnoxious? Here's some tips you could do, all right? Bam, by the way, my stuff's pretty good. I think you might like it. Maybe you could buy it. It was a whole message. Results in advance. You can move someone closer to their goal in your marketing. Every single step that you move them on that timeline to their desired outcome, every time you move them closer by helping them, their desire to buy your stuff increases, as does your credibility. 
and it goes up exponentially with every single step. Cool? And I think I better wrap it up with the last point before I get shot at by the video dudes back there. The results in advance list favor technique beach video. That was a weird sounding line. If you look at my blog, you'll see my marketing stuff. You'll see there's a video that shows people how to build a list. That's results in advance. I give people a technique which says, uh, shows them how to get more money out of their market by doing them a big favor and them asking them a favor in return. Results in advance. Immediately applicable stuff that they can do now. The beach video, which was aptly entitled Naked Dudes Playing Volleyball or something like that, was speaking to their core identity because it showed me on a journey to the beach. I ended up at the beach, all right? All core identity. And finally, sometimes to avoid seeming like you're patronizing people, you, need to, you can't come out and say this is what you're probably thinking to a market because no one wants to be told what we're probably thinking over and over again. After a while, you're like, dude, you don't know what I'm thinking. Shut up, right? It's normal. So sometimes you have to borrow their voice and let someone else be their voice. In this case, if you look on the blog and see my marketing, you'll see a case study with a guy named Gohair Chowdhury. He is a, uh, another uh, internet marketing dude who interviewed me. He borrowed the voice of the market and said, when I saw this, I thought it was hype. What's the difference between this and manipulation? Why is this so good? And he basically grilled me. So he borrowed the voice of the market, essentially. He spoke for them in a true and congruent manner. And that... That is it. I think I have to wrap up. Sorry. Got to go. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, give Frank a now big hand. Outstanding. Thanks, man. Awesome job, man. That's outstanding. Okay.